Open Access is making your research outputs free for everyone to read, so there are no paywalls or barriers to access. This also means the research can be reused as it has relatively few copyright and licensing restrictions. However, at the minute a lot of research is not open access and it's not the default. So if you're on campus, you'll rarely be asked to pay for an article. However, that's because it's already been paid for by the institution through subscriptions to the journal. If you're off campus or you're at an institution which doesn't have a subscription to a publication, you will start to see paywalls asking you to pay for an individual article or book chapter, uh, to rent it, to reuse it with different conditions. So in this case, the user is required to pay for access. Now that payment is to offset the costs of publication, which certainly isn't free. So in terms of production and organization, storage, management, distribution, publicity, the publishers put a lot of work into the process. However, some of those costs have escalated to a point at which fairly large universities and affluent universities have struggled to pay for all the subscriptions it would like. And so open access is partly about redressing that balance. But there are other benefits to open access for both authors, institutions and society in general. So if work is available to everyone, it's likely to be receiving more exposure. More people can just see it without hitting a barrier. That can include practitioners at other institutions who don't have access through their subscriptions, which means if other researchers are using your work, the citation rates may be higher. It may lead to influence of government policy and just the general fairness of the public being able to access work that they paid for. The other angle is that a lot of funders require open access. So there are mandates which say the taxpayer funded this research, therefore this work must be made available to the public again. The key change of recent years is that Hefke, who managed the REF, the Research Excellence Framework Exercise, introduced an open access policy. This applies to all researchers, regardless of who their funder of their grants was, or even if work is unfunded. Any articles to be submitted to the REF now need to be made open access. So how is this done? Well, there are two main routes, and they're referred to as the gold and the green routes. And we'll explain what they are and how we go about doing them. With the gold route, you're making the final published version of an article immediately available to everyone. So you go to a publication page, you'll see an indication that it's open access, and that the reuse rights, in this case, are the Creative Commons Attribution License, which means the work can be downloaded, edited, redistributed, as long as there is correct attribution involved. So a very liberal license. So it's free to read and free to reuse. Now, as we mentioned, publishers don't do that work for free. And in order to recoup those costs, they charge for gold open access. Now, they charge the author, but that is often paid through a funder, such as the RCUK, or via an institution. So instead of the user paying, it's the distributor of the work that's paying. And the average price for an article is £1,800 plus VAT. So to make one article open access in one publication is £2,000. It's a significant cost. And if you add that up over the cost of all the articles an institution or a grant holder produces, the cost is still significant. Not everyone is publishing in open access journals or has money to pay for gold open access. So the alternative, the more sustainable route, is the green route to open access. So in this case, you publish under subscription, and if you don't have access to that subscription, you'll be asked to pay as a reader. However, what the author would do is to archive a version of their paper in what's called a repository. And in the case of Newcastle University, that's ePrints. So they would take their final author version, meaning it's formatted by the author rather than being copy edited and typeset by the publisher. So the author uploads this to a repository and it's freely available to the public. Now there's no cost for doing that. Most publications allow for this for free. There's no cost to the author. However, many publishers will say, you need to delay access to this by six months or 12 months. When you put your work in a repository, we're not saying here that you need to know where that author works and what repository they've used. So advanced search is not required. You search in the same way as you would for any article, and it should surface things in a repository. So in the example on the slide here, we've got the journal article at the top in Google Scholar Search. We've then got PubMed Central, 
Durham's repository, various other repositories show up. So these versions are surfaced and discoverable. They're also harvested by a range of services, in this case a meta repository which links together all the repositories in the UK and around the world to make a single place where you can access research that's made green open access. So how does this affect you? The thing you may be most concerned about at the moment is the production of your thesis. And as well as the nice bound print version, you can think about producing an electronic version. And this is the Newcastle University eThesis repository, very similar to ePrints, but in this case for theses. And you can make these available for free. So the university encourages students to submit an electronic copy, but certain funders require that. For example, again, the RCUK. If you do get to the stage of publishing, say, a conference proceeding or a journal article, consider open access. And we appreciate it's not going to be the only consideration about where you publish. But think about the kind of policies that they have and what you can do, what rights you retain to the work that you've created. If your work's accepted for publication, congratulations, and you'll get an email telling you that that's the case and asking you to sign some forms. And while it seems quite tedious, please do look at the small print on those and see. Once you've signed that, you've committed to a contract and you're tied by what the publisher does. Until that point, there's room to negotiate. So if you're still at Newcastle when you publish, we'd recommend you add your publications to ePrints. And you can do that through My Impact. All you need to do is upload your manuscript and we'll do the rest. So we'll check publisher terms and conditions, we'll apply an embargo, and we'll make it available in ePrints and let you know when that's done. Also think about more open practice. So during the research process, during your writing note process, the dissemination afterwards open is a way of thinking and a way of working that's integrating into the entire research life cycle. Now I've talked mainly about journal articles and conference proceedings. Open access can apply to any kind of output. And we see here a monograph that is free to download. So it's an ebook, and you can download it as PDF or EPUB, or you can do a print on demand to buy the paperback. More creative outputs may need more creative thinking. And this is from the University of Arts London and a performance. And the outputs of that are made open access with a Creative Commons license. Similarly with music here based at Newcastle, some open access music that's embedded out on SoundCloud. And student run conferences, a way of increasing the visibility of your work, making it available to more people. So taking in submissions and making those fully open access. Alongside open access is the idea of open data. So data is very expensive to collect, but very cheap to distribute. And so we can save money and we can save time and effort for research if we share this more openly. And many funders are again starting to mandate this. Peer review is also something that's becoming more open and transparent. A number of journals and publications are now moving towards open, more transparent peer review process and trying to think about how authors can receive credit for that. And finally, projects like Open Source Malaria are looking at the entire research process becoming a public endeavor. So everything's open, everything is shared, and anyone can contribute to it. it obviously, there's a lot more management, and it's not for everyone, but it's a direction of travel that open is going in. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of open access, but if you do have any follow-up questions and you want to get in touch, these are our details. Thank you.